Hey, this is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. And following up on a video that I did yesterday on the most dangerous doctrine. And this is something I feel very strongly about uh, because I've seen so much tied in with this particular system of belief. Um, what I'm talking about is Reformed theology. And what we mean, what we need, so we need to define terms. What do we mean? By reformed theology. Basically, reformed theology is the the concept of God, um, the teaching about salvation, um, justification, all these different words that we hear used sometimes in the religious realm, the teachings that came from the reformers. Okay, so we're talking then about, about men like Martin Luther, uh, John Calvin, etc., 16th century, 17th century. Uh, reformers who came out of Roman Catholicism because they had seen the abuses. They knew that what uh, the Roman Catholic Church had been teaching was wrong and what they were practicing was wrong. So I started out yesterday laying out the foundation for this series of videos. Reform theology is, is based in the teaching of John Calvin. Um, and I, I defined that yesterday. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, Uncle Paul and Aunt Gail, hope you guys are doing well, and I appreciate you watching. Love you guys. Hey, Gene Bailey, hope you're doing well today as well. Thanks for watching. Uh, so the, the doctrine of Calvin, and, and let me say this too before I get started. So I was doing my live stream yesterday, and I don't know what happened. And uh, the I, I wasn't getting notifications, so after I disconnected, I saw that I had some comments on the video, so I'll address those today too. But anyway... <clears throat> Reformed theology is based in the tenets of John Calvin's doctrine. I addressed those yesterday. We talked about the word tulip, total hereditary depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. And I mean, you can Google this stuff. You can read about it. It's, um, <clears throat> it's, it's prevalent. Most of your mainline denominations hold to some form or another of um, Calvinism. So one of the viewers yesterday said this uh, that I want to address I would have addressed yesterday, but like I said, didn't see it. Some folks in the Reformed theology are not all five-point Calvinists. They might be three-point Calvinists. And that's a true statement, David, and I appreciate that. Um, and you really find that in a lot of, of different uh, denominational settings. Uh, just for instance, the doctrine of premillennialism, okay? The idea that Christ is going to live on earth, reign on earth for a thousand years in the millennium. Well, there are, <laughs> there are all kinds of branches of millennialism. Postmillennialism, premillennialism, dispensational premillennialism. I mean, they're they're all different brands of it. But the the core, the core teachings of Calvinism are that man is that man is totally depraved. Okay, he's born with a sinful nature, and there's nothing that he can do that's good. At the core of Reformed theology, that's what we're talking about. And again, most of your mainline denominations, and like I said yesterday, even some within the churches of Christ hold this view. And like I told you yesterday, I, you know, for years I've heard preachers talking to Christians about how sinful they are. Um, and, and they'll quote Romans 3 and verse 23, and, and that is not what Romans 3, 23 is talking about. But in an effort to make a point, that, and, and I, so I'll admit, yes, Christians sin. There's, no, there's nobody that's perfect, but, but Christians are not sinners. Okay, they don't live in the practice of sin, and First John three addresses that. So to use Romans three twenty three to prove a point, you may be proving the right point, but don't use that verse. That's not what Paul's talking about there. So that's kind of a sidebar, um, just to say that again, at the core of Reformed theology is the concept of original sin. So I told you yesterday about this video that I had seen about this guy. And, and like I said yesterday, I had only heard this in theory, um, that, that babies are sinful beings. I, you know, I've talked about it, I've studied it, but I've never heard actually personally anybody verbalize this concept that when a child is born, when an infant comes into this world, they are sinful at birth. So I told you I would share with you what he said. <clears throat> and here are his words. Uh... And this brings up that discussion of the fall of mankind, and I addressed that yesterday somewhat, that the, this concept, the word, or the phraseology, the fall of man, is nowhere in Scripture. And I understand what people mean by that, but it's not... When people talk about the fall of man, they're talking about Calvinism. It, it's, 
it's a Calvinistic phrase. It's, it's, it's typically followed up with Calvinistic teaching. Again, that man has a sinful nature and we can't help but do it. So anyway, this was really the first time I had actually heard this verbalized. This is what he said, talking about infants. Since the, and I wrote it down word for word. Since the fall, with, with the first Adam as our federal head, uh, we, let's see, we are averse to all things good. And then I want you to pay attention to what he says here, because again, by definition, Reformed theology is a doctrine that comes from the Reformation movement. So this, this is what he says immediately after he says that. He says, listen to the confessions. And he, he quotes the Westminster Confession of Faith and the London Confession of Faith. Instead of going to Scripture, he goes to these documents that were written by Calvinistic theologians. And I find that very um, troubling, obviously. So he quotes the Westminster Confession of Faith to prove his point that we're, all, we're, we're averse to all good things. And then he says this, our sin comes from our sin nature. It's who we are. If we don't understand original sin, then we don't understand the sinfulness of sin. So again, this is that concept that when we're born, when any human's born, they come out of the womb and they're sinful. They're full of sin. They have a sinful nature ultimately inherited from Adam and Eve because of their sin. But listen to this statement again. If we don't understand original sin, then we don't understand the sinfulness of sin. This guy is a top-notch um, Reformed theologian. Uh, he's a top-notch Calvinist. And what he says there is it completely contradicts what the Bible teaches. He says if we don't understand original sin, we don't understand the sinfulness of sin. In other words, how bad sin really is. The fact of the matter is we can go to the Bible to see the sinfulness of sin, if you want to put it that way. And I've actually put it that way too uh, before. Um, the Bible talks to us about the sinfulness of sin. I don't need the Westminster Confession of Faith. I don't need the London Confession. I don't need the Canons of Dort that, I looked at, that we looked at yesterday. I don't need some man-made document to tell me that sin is bad. Because listen to what Scripture says here. Um, uh, so Romans 7 talks about this, beginning in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would have not known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. Paul's making the point here that the law is a good thing. In fact, he goes, uh, goes on down in verse 12. He says, The law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. And he's talking about the law of Moses. And one reason it was good was because it shows you for instance, that Paul talks about, that covetousness is bad. And he said, I wouldn't have known that had it not been for the law. Paul doesn't say, I wouldn't have known that covetousness was bad had it not been for original sin. Now that's, again, that's what this Calvinist teaches. And that's what Calvinism teaches. That's what denominationalism teaches. That we're all born in sin with a sinful nature. The commandment, okay, God's law revealed what sin is and how bad sin is. Now, the problem with the law of Moses, it couldn't forgive sin. Um, that's, and that's why we have the new covenant, thankfully. So this guy says that. But listen to what he goes on to say. People who, who, people who do not believe in original sin don't have children. Now, he's trying to be funny and cute in his sermon here, but he's making a point. He's trying to back up this concept of original sin. People who don't believe in original sin don't have children. It, so this is that quote I shared with you yesterday. Here's what he said. That's not a little angel. That's a viper in a diaper. And the crowd, I mean, the crowd just roared. They thought that was hilarious. He kept a fairly straight face because, again, he's making a point that the Calvinists believe. And they'll defend this. That's not a little angel. That's a viper in a diaper. And, he, and so his point, or his, in his effort to show how sinful humanity is, here's what he says. You, talking about an infant. You can barely open your eyes. You can barely hold up your head. You can't sit up. You can't crawl. But you can let everyone know that you're running things. The angry cry happens early. We are sinners. So, to prove original sin, he says, babies cry. Uh, this is why, and th so this is why I've titled this series of, of videos, The Most Dangerous Doctrine. 
it denies, and it, I, no, denied, I guess that's not the right word, it flatly contradicts what the Bible says. So let's take this concept into Scripture. Does the Bible say that humans are born with a sinful nature? Um, there are two passages that will answer this right out. Now, I know typically the Calvinist will go, the denominationalist will go to Psalm 51.5, Surely in sin my mother conceived me. Um, and they'll say, well, see, he was sinful when he was born. That's not what David was saying. David was not saying he was sinful from birth. Now, if you have a New International Version of the Bible, that's exactly what it says, that I was sinful from the moment my mother uh, conceived me. Now, the, the New International Version is a terrible version of the Bible, and that's just one illustration of that fact. So if, if it's the case, if it's really true that infants are born, that we come out of the womb, we're brought into this world with a sinful nature, and that's why we cry, listen to what Jesus says here. <clears throat> Again, two passages will answer this doctrine forever. Uh, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, okay, unless you are converted and become as little children, uh, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Okay, so that's... I mean, that's pretty, pretty plain. Think about that. Let's, <laughs> so Calvinism, this guy's calling children of viper, vipers and diapers. Um, unless you are converted and become as vipers, you shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little viper is the greatest in the kingdom of God. That is, this concept of, um, the next passage is Luke 18, of original sin... And humans born of the sinful nature flatly contradicts Scripture. Now, Luke, I like Luke 18 better because of the, the a particular word that it uses here. Uh, Luke 18, beginning in verse 15. Then they also brought, in the New King James here, I didn't look at it in the King James. Let me pull this up real quick. Um, the New King James says, Then they brought unto him infants. So let me pull it up here on my, my sword app. Luke 18, 15. Okay, King James says the same thing. They brought him infant, infants. And that's interesting. The Greek word there is brephe. And it's the same word that's used in uh, Luke chapter 1 when it says the babe leaped in Mary's womb. Or is it Elizabeth's womb? But anyway, it's, it's talking about an infant. So they also brought infants to him. Okay, these are the vipers in diapers. These are the ones that this guy says you can't hold your eyes open, you can't hold your head up, you can't sit up, but you can cry and let everybody know that you're in charge, and this is the cry of anger. So they bring these infants to Jesus that he might touch them. Now listen to this. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. Okay, the disciples, hey, we're busy. We don't need these kids around here. <laughs> uh, it's kind of that concept. I heard this some when I was growing up. It's better to be, kids need to be seen and not heard. Well, get these kids out of here. Now listen to Jesus' response. Jesus called them to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them. Listen, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. So let's, let's plug in the Calvinistic teaching to that verse. Let the little vipers come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little viper will by no means enter it. I mean, it's just, it blows my mind that people who are supposedly so intelligent and so highly educated would do something like that to Scripture. It makes no sense whatsoever. It's completely contradictory to what the Bible says. So to the, to the guy who commented yesterday, like I said, I'm sorry I didn't see it yesterday. For whatever reason, I don't know. Um, an, an, another comment in these regards is this uh, from yesterday's video. I would say the fall in the garden even affected the earth. Romans chapter 8. The earth groans in travail. We, and th this is what I want to address. I'm not going to address Romans 8. Um, we could spend a lot of time there. But this is what I want to address. We all have the propensity to sin, which is called concupiscence. Uh, you find the word concupiscence, 
Uh, that's not typically a word that we use in our everyday English. You'll find in the King James Version, I think, three times. So he says, this commenter says, we all have the propensity to sin, which is called concupiscence. Something drastically happened to humans after Adam and Eve sinned. Call it a sinful nature or a propensity to sin. So looking up this word um, concupiscence, the Greek word is epithumia. And it's actually translated in a variety of ways in the New Testament. The very basic meaning of this word is desire, strong desire. Most of the time, in fact, in the New Testament, it's translated as lust. So to say that um, we all have the propensity to sin, which is called concupiscence, that's not accurate. That's not what concupiscence is. That, this is a strong desire. Now, here's the interesting thing. The, the way this word is translated, sometimes concupiscence, that Greek word, is, a, is used positively. And so I wrote down two examples of that here. And, and one, most Christians probably could quote. Paul says in Philippians 1 uh, and verse 23, let's see here. Yeah, for I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ. That's the same word that's translated concupiscence, which is is an evil thing but it's it, it all that word means is a strong desire now teaching that we have a sinful nature is that that's all we desire to do and this guy that said this about babies and vipers and things like this vipers and diapers he said that's all we are we're just sinful nature that's all we desire to do we don't seek god um, because we are sinful sinful from birth so I want to share three things with you, and then I'll wrap this video up. It's going to be a little bit shorter today. Three things that this Reformed theology on a very fundamental level contradicts, and I'm talking specifically about total depravity. That is that we are born in sin to such an extent that we can't do anything because we are sinful. We can't choose if we're going to be saved. Um, God's, God has to do that for us. Um, remember the, the quote I shared with you yesterday that some people teach that faith is the gift that God gives. And that's absolutely inaccurate. Uh, faith is not the gift, a gift that comes from God. Faith comes by hearing, as Paul says in Romans 10, 17, the Word of God. Now it's interesting, um, when you look at that, the, the Greek word for word in Romans 10, 17 is rhematos. It's not the typical word that we think of. It's rhematos, which means the divine utterances. If we want faith, we need to know the divine utterances. It's not some miraculous or mysterious gift that God drops on us one day. So, um, because we're totally depraved, God has to choose us. Those are your first two tenets of Calvinism, and these are, the, these are very fundamental te teachings to, um, uh, to reform theology, which is very, a very dangerous doctrine. So number one, the Bible teaches that sin is not inherited. And this, I mean, we can find this from the Old Testament to the New over and over again. It's amazing to me that we even have to talk about this. But the, to me, the greatest chapter to discuss uh, this concept is Ezekiel chapter 18. Two verses will answer this idea that sin is inherited. Uh, uh, Ezekiel 18, 4. Behold, God says... All souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Listen to that. The soul who sins shall die. Okay? Then you go down to verse uh, 20, Ezekiel 18, 20. The soul who sins shall die. The Son shall not bear the guilt of the Father, nor the Father bear the guilt of the sin. Original sin teaches, Reformed theology teaches, Calvinism teaches that we do inherit sin that the Son is guilty of the, the, the sins of the Father. God says, no. The Father shall not bear the guilt of the Son, neither shall the Son bear the guilt of the Father. Now listen to this, the end of uh, Ezekiel 18, 20. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. In other words, if you're righteous, you'll be rewarded accordingly. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. If you're wicked, you'll be rewarded accordingly. So that's number one in answer to this concept of total depravity and um, that, that God, if we're going to be saved, if we're going to have faith, God has to do that for us. Sin is a personal, uh, a matter of personal accountability and personal responsibility. I'm not guilty of anybody else's sin. Now, I can suffer the consequences of somebody else's sin. 
And certainly that's the case with Adam and Eve. Humanity today still faces the consequences of their sins. I mean, we still die. Uh, that, that's the consequence of sin. Um, uh, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. The, the consequence of sin is death. Well, Christ died for us, thankfully. But anyway, um, sin is not inherited. And that's the foundational teaching of Calvinism, that it is. Uh, secondly, man has a choice. And again, just like with, with um, uh, sin not being inherited, this concept of choice is found throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. I, one verse I think most people would think of who know the Bible is Joshua 24, 15. Yep, the last part of that verse says, the soul that sins, it shall die. But I think an even more convincing, um, well, an entire chapter that addresses this is Deuteronomy chapter 28. This is right before Moses dies. He's reaffirming the covenant with the Israelites. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 14. If you keep my judgments, my commandments, and my statutes, here are going to be the blessings. That's the first 14 verses of Deuteronomy 28. You start in verse 15, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God. And it goes all the way through verse, um, let's see, well, verse 68 to the end of Deuteronomy 28. Every human has a choice. Sin is not inherited, and we have a, each human has a choice as to whether or not he will sin. And, you know, that, uh, from the New Testament, uh, that's Romans chapter 6. So I'm going to turn over there real quick. Um, here's the thing, as, as I'm thinking about Romans chapter 6. So th these quotes I shared from you, and I see some of you have come in a little bit later if you're wondering where I'm coming from in this. I shared this quote uh, from this Reformed theologian about um, inherited sin. And to prove his teaching on that, he said, consider what the confessions say, the Westminster Confession of Faith, the London Confession, and so on. I don't need those documents. I don't care what those documents say. Um, it's interesting. You know, I've got them. I've, in fact, I've got uh, two, I think those are one-inch, three-ring binders full of, I've got from the second century, the Apostles' Creed, all the way up through the latest, um, oh, what's the Catholic, what do the Catholics do? Anyway, uh, I can't think of what it's called, but I've got them. I don't need them, but it's interesting history to study. So Romans, if, so I've shown you from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 28, but you go to the New Testament. So if we're born inherently sinful, and if we're going to be saved, God has to unconditionally elect us, choose us, Romans 6 means absolutely nothing. Um, Romans 6, 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in a lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. We have a choice today. And before we become... And, and this is... I understand Romans is talking to, to Christians and talking to the Church of Christ at Rome. Uh, but even before we become a Christian, we have a choice in the matter. Um, it's, it's not, sin is not inherent in us. We do have a choice in that. And the fact of the matter is we can resist God. We can turn away from Him. This idea of an unconditional election and irresistible grace, that's the, again, that's at the root of Reformed theology, that's at the root of most of your mainline denominations, is anti-biblical. Um, it's not just that it's not found in Scripture, it's that it runs completely against what Scripture teaches. I think of Acts chapter 7, I was turning over there, um, as Stephen is preaching to these Jews in Jerusalem. I want you to listen to what he says here. and, and try, So, I'm going to start reading in Acts 7, verse 51. Try to plug in Reformed theology to what Stephen says here. And now, it's, it's interesting because, because when you go back into Acts chapter um, 6, it says that Stephen, Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, is full of, the, uh, of, full of faith and power, Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, and they couldn't resist what he was saying they couldn't resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Stephen is full of the Holy Spirit as he's saying these things. So in Acts 7 51, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. So the question then is, how, do you, how does a person resist the Holy Spirit? 
how did the the Jews to whom uh, Stephen was talking resist him? Listen, Acts 7.52. Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? That's how you resist the Holy Spirit. You reject His Word. Um, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one. Okay, that's reference to Jesus. Of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. That's resistance. Again, Reformed theology, Calvinism, and mainline denominationalism teaches if you're going to be saved, God has to do something for you. And I know there are varying degrees, like the commenter said yesterday, there are varying degrees to this doctrine. But Calvinism, when you break it down, when you break Reformed theology down, says you don't have a choice. You're born sinful. If you're going to be saved, God has to choose you. And that, that choosing is irresistible. That's the I in tulip, irresistible grace. Stephen says the exact opposite. Now, if Stephen, here's the thing, if Stephen weren't enough, um, Jesus says the exact same thing. And th so this is the end of Matthew chapter 23. Uh, this is not long, actually, before the death of Christ. Listen to what Jesus says, uh, Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often, listen to this, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. I mean, that to me, that right there, that's we could end this entire series of videos right now. We're not going to, but um, that's Jesus talking. I wanted to do this for you, but you were not willing. He says that same thing over in... Uh, over in John chapter 5. I know I'm doing a lot of turning, but that, that's the thing. There's so many things in the Bible that just flat out destroy Calvinism, that just destroy this concept that we have a sinful nature and God has to save us if we're going to be saved. Um, John 5 and verse... Oh, oh, we can start in verse 38. But you do not have His word abiding in you because whom He sent, Him you do not believe. He's talking about Himself. God sent me, you don't believe me. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me, that you may have life. And that word willing there in the Greek language is a word, we would spell it in English, um, T-H-E-L-O, thelo. And it means to, uh, it has the idea of exercising the will, you, you intend to do this. Well, you are not intending you're not attempting to come to me that you may have life. That's choice. That's not sinful nature. That's not a, again, I know I've mentioned this quite often, but again, it just kind of blows my mind still. That's not viper in a diaper stuff. This, this, these are rational human beings, spiritual beings, who hear the Word of God and reject it. And every human is capable of that. Reformed theology dies in John chapter 5, and it dies in Matthew 23, and it dies in Acts chapter 7. I mean, there's... There are so many instances of Bible passages that completely destroy Reformed theology. So let me wrap up today's video by saying this, and I appreciate all of you who are on here. Um, I always appreciate all my watchers and commenters and questioners and things like that. Uh, let's wrap this up by saying this. It's the most dangerous doctrine because man has no choice in anything. And, and certain branches of, of Reformed theology, certain, um, certain leans to it, even, even say things like, you, the, your de you, your, the time of your birth is predetermined and the time of your death is predetermined. I don't know how many times over the years I've heard somebody say at a funeral or something, well, it, the, it, the Lord knew it was His time. The Lord took Him. Um, that's fatalism. That's, that's determinism. Again, that is, that is an anti-free will concept that we're, we're all born at a certain time because God determined it, and we're going to die at a certain time because God determined it. If that's true, okay, let's take that to its ultimate, to its logical conclusion. If that's true, then the person who rejects God, let's say, who, who turns away from God and goes out, gets drunk, and dies in an automobile accident, God did that. Because God determines when you'll die. 
Um, that's what a person is really saying when they say things like, and, and, and I understand that people are trying to comfort people. Sometimes the best thing you can do to comfort somebody is stay quiet. Just be there with them. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to come up with some um, bold statement to, to strengthen somebody. Uh, but when we say things like that, we're making God uh, a very much a respecter of persons. And we're taking man's free will, man's ability to choose completely out of the picture. That's why this doctrine of Reformed theology is so dangerous. Um, and, and not only is it dangerous, but uh, it, you think of passages, or I think of passages like John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Well, to a Reformed theologian, to a Calvinist, there are only a certain number of people are going to be saved. Um, so Christ didn't really die for the world. That's limited atonement, the L in TULIP. Again, there are so many passages in Scripture that, uh, that completely destroy that concept. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. I tell you, um, Reformed theology is the most dangerous doctrine there is. Every one of your mainline denominations is established on Reformed theology. It gets their theology from the Reformation movement, from John Calvin, from John Wesley, from Martin Luther. And there are hints. One of the commenters said yesterday, um, let's see, I, I can't exactly find it here right now, but how closely things are related to uh, Catholicism and things like this. And that's true. It, it's, it's all kind of a big mixture, big melting pot of all this stuff. Uh, very late. That's okay, Sheila. You can go back and watch it, but I appreciate you being on here today and hope you're doing well. Um, th there is so much entanglement in Reformed theology from Roman Catholicism because that's what Martin Luther came out of. That's what John Calvin came out of and, and a lot of these other Reformers, but then that's all they were trying to do was reform Catholicism. That's why now you have the Baptist Church and the Presbyterian Church and the Methodist Church. They weren't going back to Scripture. They are reforming. And, and, you know, look up the definition of restoration versus reformation. Two completely different concepts. They were trying to reform Catholicism. And so they went in a completely different direction. And, and it's that 16th century, I tell you, with this, the birth of this reformed theology that, that denominationalism just exploded. And that's why we have these denominations that we have today that, that teach you're born in sin, and if you're going to be saved, God will choose you. And once you are saved, you can never be lost. Once saved, always saved. It's crazy, and it's a very dangerous doctrine. So I need to wrap it up. I've been going for about 35 minutes already. I appreciate all of you so much for watching. If you ever have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in here in the comment section. Send me a private message, however you want to do it, and I'll be happy to respond to those uh, accordingly. So it's the weekend. I probably won't see you again till Monday. But uh, thanks again for watching today, and I will see you on the next video.